Hi, everybody. Welcome to INE Live. I'm your host, Katherine Brown. We have a great stream for you today. Dr. Russ White is here, network architect, author, and one of only a handful of people worldwide who have attained CCAR status. He's talking with INE's Keith Bogard and taking your questions as well. So strap in, get ready to feel motivated, and get ready to unleash your potential. First, as we do each stream here on INE Live, I want to let you know we are streaming live across social media platforms right now, including LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. Be sure to like and subscribe on the social media platform you're using so you can stay in the loop when we do go live. We want you to get involved. Talk to us, talk to others. We'd love to see that. Chat's already jumping this morning. Our team is monitoring chat. If you have a question, uh, put a cue at the beginning of that so we can find those easily. We'd love to see your comments as well. And we'll get to as many of those questions as we can today. Right now, I want to pass it over to Keith Bogart. Keith is a technical training instructor and course developer here at INE. He's been with us a little more than seven years. He spent 17 years at Cisco. And if you Google his name, you will find a horror film actor that is not this Keith Bogart, but he is just as good looking and almost as famous, right, Keith? That's absolutely <laughs> right. And, and some people who watch my videos might consider them horror. I, that makes me sad, but thank you for that introduction. <laughs> so, well, yeah, horror so, would be better than boring, Keith. Well, yes, better than boring any day of the week. If I can scare people, that's at least some emotional reaction. Um, so welcome, everybody. Uh, as Catherine said, today I am interviewing the famous and somewhat infamous Russ White. Um, you know, he, he provided me a, with a bio of himself, and rather than just paraphrasing it, I'm just going to read it to you real quickly here. So if you don't know who this is, uh, you can be just as impressed as I am. So Russ White is a well-known voice in computer networking, where he advocates for simplicity, privacy, and the decentralized internet. He co-hosts the Hedge podcast, serves on the Internet Architecture Board, and serves in a leadership role in the FR Routing open source community. By the way, FR Routing stands for Free Range Routing. So if you don't know what that is, look it up. It's pretty cool. Uh, Russ has co-authored more than 45 software patents, 15 books, and probably hundreds of hours of video training. Uh, he holds a PhD in philosophy, so don't try to get into a philosophical discussion with him. You will not win. Uh, from Southeast Baptist Theological Seminary, a Master of Arts in Christian Ministry from Shepherd's Theological Seminary, and a Master of Sciences in Information Technology from Capella University. And he's coming out with another book, uh, pretty soon, the fall of this year, called Unintended Dystopia. So there's uh, his introduction. So, so Russ, who uh, are you talking us... about, Keith? <laughs> <laughs> so for those of us who, who do know you a little bit or know, know some of your achievements, why don't we, let me start and say by, uh, I don't intend this to be a technical discussion. I want to use this opportunity for people to get to know you get to know your history and walk away from this being inspired and motivated in their own networking journey. So that's that's my goal here. So with that, why don't you tell us, first of all, how did you get first get into the field of networking? Oh, it was totally accidental. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good start. <laughs> I did electronic engineering for many years, actually. I grew up in a family of engineers and I did electronic engineering for many years. And when I was in the U.S. Air Force working on airfield equipment, things like VORs and TACANs, they said, you know, we kind of need somebody to help us work on the network over here and to help build computers and do some coding and stuff like that. And since you know basic and you know C, uh, you know, we should uh, bring you over here and let you learn how to build computers and do work on this stuff. So that's how I got into it was essentially that. And well, after a while, electronics got a little bit boring. They started replacing all the fun cube type stuff with all the new digital stuff, and it just wasn't any fun anymore. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you just you just mentioned right there that some of your uh, preliminary knowledge was in like basic and C programming stuff. Do you think that in today's world, um, someone who aspires to get into networking, who maybe knows next to nothing about it, needs to have some sort of scripting or programming knowledge to get into that field or be successful in it? Uh, so my response there is always, I think you need to develop and learn the attitude of a coder, but I don't think you necessarily need to be a coder or expect yourself to become a full-time coder to do good in networking. But being able to read C 
I mean, I always tell this that I have a copy of um, FR routing on my laptop. <clears throat> and if somebody says, well, how does BGP do this? The first temptation is to go read the RFCs. But actually what's better is to go look at the code. And if you know the code, you can actually read the BGP code from FR routing and it's a fairly good implementation. So you can figure out what BGP would do in any given situation. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, I, I think back to, you know, you and I were at Cisco at, at we overlapped in our time there. And, and when I was mm -hmm. in the TAC, uh, you were a, a TAC escalation engineer at that time. Um, and one of the things I think about as I read your bio is the fact that you've authored several books, you've authored several patents. And what stands out to me is that you've gone above and beyond the typical role of a network admin or a network engineer or even a network architect because you've actually created things. You've created new protocols. So one of the things I, I wonder about, maybe other people do too, are can you let me know or share with us some defining moments and decisions from your past that propelled you from being just another network engineer to someone who actually created new things? Um, yeah, so a lot of people say, how do you get involved in all the patents and this new creation stuff? I think part of it is just being in the right place at the right time. And part of it is being perpetually unsatisfied, uh, never quite happy with what is out there and what's going on and how, you know, trying to think about well, how could this really be done better? How could you make this simpler? How could you make this faster or whatever it is? Uh, and I think that's just something that carried over from our prior life in electronic engineering and the other parts of my life that I'm just never really happy with, um, <laughs> with what I've done. <laughs> you know, I have, I have this girlfriend and every night she calls me and she said, what'd you get done today? And I'm always like, nothing. <laughs> So an attitude of perpetual dissatisfaction is actually a good thing in the networking world is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I think so. You know, it's, at, at least with yourself and with what you've done, uh, you know, you never feel like you're completely done and you never feel like you're completely like on top of it. And I think that's yeah. a good thing. I think, you know, it drives you to do more. Absolutely. And then having the skill set to actually take that to the next level and create things because you have the skill set of coding or scripting or whatever. Uh, helps take what's yeah. percolating in your brain and make it a reality. Yeah, and that's that that comes down to your shape of knowledge questions, right? Like what is what's the ideal shape of knowledge? And we often think when I was doing my PhD, you know, one person said to me, well, well one of my mentors in that field said to me, you know, a PhD is basically diving deeper and, and going stronger and, and finding out something and coming up drier than anybody else has ever done before. You're just basically do, looking for something very, very narrow. And I think that we often do that. We tend to be very narrow, but the reality is this concept of a T-shaped knowledge, um, take getting away from uh, jack of all trades, master of none, and making it jack of all trades, master of one. Being able to code, being able to just do things that allow you to break out and to think about uh, you know, different problems. I think a lot of innovation happens at the edges between multiple fields. It's not in a particular field. It's when you merge two things. Yeah. And that, that sort of dovetails into the next question I was going to ask you, which is that I get a lot of questions on, on LinkedIn and other platforms about people are, you know, looking at the world of networking and how broad and how wide it is. And it keeps going into all sorts of different directions. And they ask me, what should I be learning? What's the next best thing? What will be helpful in my career? And how would you answer that question? Um, everything. Everything. That's <laughs> great. There's no stress there. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So I think that you need to be a bit intentional about the scope of your knowledge and to think about what you want to do. I mean, I see some question here about A plus and N plus. Should I go for the CCNA or for some type of cybersecurity cert? Um, you know, I think you need to do all of it. I think you just really need to be a continuous learner and just jump out there and learn what you can and just see certifications rather than as being goals but rather being guides for everything, right? Like what, what, what do experts in this field think I should know in order to consider myself good at it, right? And that's why I see certifications. I don't see them as, an, as a goal in, the, in and of themselves. I see them as these are people who are smarter than I am, 
who have studied this field and they believe this is the body of knowledge that I need to consider myself good at this, or at least the basic, I should say, the basic knowledge, body of knowledge. So that's kind of my view is, I mean, just pick one, just go do it. Know that this is one decision you've made, go finish something, make another decision and move on, right? Keep, keep learning. Don't, don't stress so much over any particular piece. Just keep going, learn the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. That's, that's great advice. And you know, one thing you said there that is a really great mindset to have is when approaching a certification to look at it as there are some experts above me and, and this is what they thought I should know. So that dovetails into another question I had for you, which is about the CCAR uh, designation. So uh, some of our viewers may not know what a CCAR is because so few people have attained it. And you were actually one of the authors of the CCAR certification. So can you tell us a little bit about what that certification is, what's involved in getting it, and when you were creating it, what went through your mind as far as what should be required and what shouldn't? Yeah, so I think the CCAR actually may be retired by Cisco now, but essentially it was came about because we were working on the CCDE the Cisco Certified Design Expert, which is kind of a funny story how I got involved in that in the first place as well. Um, and then I got to the point of trying to figure out, uh, you know, where we were looking at not just what goes beyond the CCDE, but we had some really great ideas, we thought, about how to build a certification. But they were so far beyond what the CCIEs were doing, the CCIE certification was doing, that we were put in a position where we needed to invent a new certification to take those ideas in. And that's really what happened. It came out of brainstorming sessions. Um, the CCAR is essentially a, <clears throat> the CCAR is or was, I don't know what the status is within Cisco, um, essentially a board exam for network engineers is just to have the idea that you have to stand in front of a group of people who are experts and throw a design up there and you know you have to convince those experts that your design is a good design you're not testing against a, a particular body of knowledge you are playing the part of an outside consultant and you are required to build a design that somebody else will agree with you as a good way to solve this problem mm -hmm. so it's it's a bit of a different kind of certification why do you think so few people achieved it i think it's too hard <laughs> that's I your fault then right because I you designed think, I think it it's, i think it's so so hard and i think it's intimidating i think people are intimidated um i was in a session at, at uh, cisco live one time and somebody asked me about it and i said well essentially the ccar is you're standing in front of alvaro Atana and um and you know myself and maybe one other person and you know just maybe Khalid Raza or somebody else and trying to convince us that you that you're a good designer and they said okay well I guess I'm not going for that one <laughs> <laughs> and that answers that question that's right <laughs> so you know I don't know if it's been retired or not you know I probably should have looked that up before I asked the question but that's if that certification right. has been retired do you think that that was a wrong decision that should still be available for people to take? Well, I, you know, from a vendor perspective, I can see how it's hard to support that kind of a certification. I'd really love to find a space to build a certification like that, that is not vendor dependent necessarily, um, and is community supported. Because, you know, vendors can't just throw a certification out there as a public service. They have to have either a marketing hook or a, a money hook that gets them the ability to do something with that certification, right? They just don't pay for stuff off the, just for whatever. So, you know, it's one of those things that uh, I think it's a very good thing. I think the networking industry needs it if it has been retired or whatever. I think that we probably need to think about how to build something like that in the future. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I am monitoring chat uh, online through all of our social media platforms and just want to bring up a question from Elijah Douglas, who's watching on YouTube right now, and it uh, relates to exactly what you guys are talking about right now. Elijah asks, I know the process to become a CCR, CCAR is a very difficult process, but if you could put a rough idea of how long it would take someone to go from zero experience in IT to becoming an architect. Oh, 
Oh my goodness, that depends on how hard you try. I think <laughs> I I would put the I would put the the number at ten to fifteen years. That's that's kind of my guess to get to move to that to that level. Um, you have to have a breadth of experience that is really really strong. You know, I call myself an infrastructure architect. That's I'm really more of a network architect. I don't really know what to call myself. Uh, you know, network, uh, network philosopher, I don't know, whatever you want to do, but <laughs> it's, um, I think that you have to have a breadth of arc, a uh, breadth of experience and knowledge. I mean, there's this thing, Keith's law that I always talk about. I've been talking about a lot recently, and there's the first corollary to Keith's law, um, which is that you can know the system you work on really well, and you can know the systems on either side of what you work on a little bit. And everything outside of that is kind of rumor and pop psychology. And it's meant to like, help you be humble about your your realm of knowledge uh that's that's kind of what this comes into and it's also kind of uh, it's kind of a way to say you know um be careful about the decisions you make outside your realm of expertise there's a lot of things like that but um the general idea for me in that is the more i kind of I reduce the rumor and pop psychology the better off I am at helping others and understanding the interaction between my system and others. And so like, I want to know how applications work. I want to know how optics work. Of course, I have a head start in optics world because I worked on radio systems for many, many years. But again, you know, I want to know all the things like, so I'll just give you another example. I'm looking for a house right now. I'm moving from, from one city to another and I'm looking for a house. And I think I'm astounding the real estate agent and the inspectors and stuff at the level of questions that I ask about what they're bringing up. And that's because I'm just a curious cat. I mean, I just want to know everything. And if you tell me something, I'm like, okay, fine. Now explain that to me. Tell me why that is. Don't, don't just tell me what it is. Tell me why that works that way. And so, so the, the appropriate word, they're astounding or frustrating them with your questions. Yeah. Well, probably both, honestly, probably both. And that's okay. Sometimes it is frustrating to the people around you, um, but you know, you've got to learn. You've got you've got to take it in and understand where things work and how they work and stuff like that to be effective at what you do, uh, and to be able to solve problems. Absolutely, and you know, with that question about network architect, I'd like to expand on that a little bit because. A lot of people, I think, have a lot of different ideas as far as what a network architect is, because that role is kind of loosely defined if it's defined anywhere. So considering that you are a network architect. Well, people say that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just stick with that for now. Yeah. Um, how would you say the, the responsibilities of a network architect differ from a network engineer? Okay, so I would put it in three levels or three or four levels. And it's not really levels of expertise. It's kind of focus of the, of the, like, I don't consider an architect to be more intelligent or better than an engineer per se. I just consider their focus to be a little bit different. So to me, an engineer is more fingers on keyboard, getting stuff done, writing scripts, you know, doing whatever needs to be done, getting things racked and stacked and knowing the optics and the hardware and the software down to the nth degree. Um, the second is more of a network designer, which is more taking requirements and business stuff in and trying to learn and understand how to translate those business things into, um, into a, a network that works and solves those problems. I think the architect, where the architect comes in is I think the architect is somebody who is willing to push back, who is willing to say, you're the business person coming to me with this question, I'm going to push back and say, I don't actually agree with your requirement, even from a business perspective. Like the architect is somebody who's willing to go say to the security people, you know, I don't really know security very well, but I can tell you that what you've just done is not really going to secure the network, you know, and is willing to actually drive back and actually not necessarily undermine, but to actually know enough about those areas to ask hard questions and make people rethink their plans. Uh, the architect's the person who comes in and they say, well, the application developer said they need X amount of latency. And the architect says, okay, why? Explain mm -hmm. how the application worked and explain to me why you need that latency and explain when you need that latency. And now let's talk about how your application works. 
Um, and that to me is where the differential is. So in order to have that level of technical knowledge, um, as well as that ability to see how everything synthesizes together and being may unafraid. or may not work. Yeah. What's that? Being unafraid. <laughs> yeah, and being unafraid, exactly. Um, a couple questions, um, and you can answer this in either order. So I guess the first question that comes to my mind is, do you think it's a requirement for someone to be a network architect that they have worked at several different jobs. In other words, you have person A who's worked for 15 years at you know Cisco or IBM or whatever and worked on their massively large network versus person B who's worked at like seven or nine different companies over the same span of time. Do you think person B is more qualified to go into that role of network architect than person A? No, I don't, I don't think so. I think that, um... I think that you can be the type of person who has 20 years of experience, but it's actually 20 times the same year of experience. And I think you can be the kind of person who has five years of experience, but you've somehow stuffed 20 years of learning into that five years of experience. And I think that uh, a lot of that has to do with, again, your willingness to reach out and to take on problems that nobody else wants to take on or that are adjacent to what you are taking on and your willingness and ability to learn other other realms uh, besides what you're doing right now so somebody who's worked on a single network for 20 years but they've made it an absolute point to learn bgp the or learn the egp learn the igp learn the peering points learn everything they can about that network may be better equipped than somebody who's changed job five times but they've only ever configured BGP at all five of those jobs. So they started cleaning up the BGP configuration at company A, did that for two years, switched to another company, cleaned up the BGP configuration for two years and blah, 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 blah. And mm -hmm. uh, so I, it just depends on how you approach uh, what you're working on. Right. Okay. And, and the other part of that question I had was, you know, just focusing on Cisco for a moment and Cisco certifications, you know, at, at the upper end, you've got the CCIE and you've got the CCDE. One is for design, mm -hmm. one is more for, for troubleshooting and, and that type of thing. Uh, once again, for someone who's shooting for the role of becoming a network architect someday, do you think they need to set their sights on achieving both of those? Oh, yeah, I think so. And I, <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to set my standards high here. Yeah. And I think you ought to have you ought to go out to college and get some degrees and cert certificates. And you ought to know something about security and you ought to know about other stuff too. Uh, you know, I just think it's, I think you ought to know about people and about business as well. You know, I, I don't think you ought to limit yourself, but troubleshooting and design are both extremely important. Um, it's all about problems and solutions and troubleshooting is all about understanding the problems and design is all about understanding the solutions. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, so there are some questions in the chat if you want to jump on those. Yes, I, I um, Catherine, I think you had one that you wanted to bring up. Can you guys hear me? Yes. We All can. right, good. I was having a little trouble with my microphone. Um, yeah, uh, we have a great question. This is from Carter Kyan watching on LinkedIn, and it pertains to exactly what you guys are talking about right now. Um, they ask, are solution architects and network architects the same? To be an architect, do we need pre-sales knowledge or experience? technical sales talking skills. Yeah, so I don't think a solution architect and a network architect are necessarily the same thing. I think a solution architect encompasses more of data and privacy and security than a network architect necessarily does. A network architect is not a subset, but more of a narrow focus than a solution architect. Pre-sales, uh, you know, there's a saying that you, um, the network that is the most elegantly and best designed but poorly presented will always will never be approved and will never work it doesn't matter if it's really well designed if it's not well presented you can forget it if it's in in the most in the the worst design in the world if it's well presented will always be implemented unfortunately and so i i don't want to talk about pre-sales knowledge or experience but your ability to present things and teach things makes a huge difference your ability to interact with an audience and, and convince people of things makes a huge difference. And honestly, I'm not the best in the world at that, but that is something that I think if you pick up the skill up, that's really, really important. 
So it sounds like you're saying that the people who want to uh, be either a solution architect or a network architect should also along their journey, find opportunities to teach others. Yep. And to present things and just to be, you know, be out there among people and uh, not necessarily to build your name and build a brand, but just to have the experience of getting pushback from the audience mm -hmm. and learning how to handle that. And, okay. uh, you know, being able to take criticism and take things in and understand questions and modify what you're working on based on those questions. Mm -hmm. And you know, so to sort of circle back to something you said earlier, you had alluded to that you had a rather interesting experience in the process of designing the CCDE exam. You want to uh, share that with us? Oh, well, this is kind of strange. So the reason the CCDE came about is because a bunch of us failed or decided to stop redoing our CCIE recertifications. And we just realized that we're not fingers on keyboard guys anymore. You know, we might be really good troubleshooters or whatever, but you know, I, I get asked in interviews sometimes when I'm looking for a job, can you name the command that does this, that, and the other? And I'm like, no, <laughs> it's not what I do, but you know, I could look it up if I needed to, but it, there's just a point where we realize that we need to have a certification that fits our skill set better. And what we were doing at that time was just designing large scale networks. So, you know, we wanted a certification that would do that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Cisco, one of the vice presidents at Cisco said, I think it's a good idea and basically wrote us a check and we did it. Are you still involved in the, the periodic updates of the CCDE? Nope, because I don't work for Cisco, so I'm outsider. Got it. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> so on, another question I had asked you or I'd run past you earlier uh, was that, you know, you've worked with several different organizations and their networks. And are there any design or implementation mistakes that you've run across that seem to be common among many different organizations? Yeah, I think two things. I see a lot of um, is that we tend to overcome, make things overly complex. We tend to pile a lot of stuff on. Uh, and it's a lot of the times it's not necessary. Uh, you know, I tell the story all the time that when I first joined the Air Force and U.S. Air Force and I worked, I walked out to the VOR, there's a piece of equipment called the VOR, and there's a waveguide. And in that waveguide that's carrying 40, you know, however many watts, 150, 250 watts of power, 1,000, whatever it is, I think it was about 1,500 actually, there was a fan that actually cut through the waveguide. And I was like, what is that? And they said, oh, that, that, that's final modulation. And it's a really, really simple solution to actually what would be a really hard problem with analog electronics. And often we go for the hard solution because we think it's cool or because we can think of a corner case five years from now that might come up. And so we're going to design around these really hard corner cases. It's kind of crazy that we do that. So we really add a lot of complexity and lit, but too much stuff in. In the same way, we focus a lot on um, too much resilience, too much redundancy in order to build resilience sometimes. You want to jump um, in again? Um, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Were you finished? No, it's fine. Yeah, yeah um, go ahead. just because as, as we're talking about, you know, kind of mistakes and some of the challenges, I've um, got a great question coming in from uh, someone watching on YouTube. Network design tends to be subjective according to experience, know-how, et cetera. So how do you deal with conflict among different designers? Yeah, it's called consensus building. You know, learn how to build consensus around a design. Although there's a really great story that we tell, um, a large provider in, in Europe once asked to get every Cisco network, uh, or, uh, every um, escalation engineer who do routing protocols, which would have been 16 of us, into a single room and do a network design for them. And the answer was, yeah, you'd get one person writing and 15 people erasing. You probably wouldn't get very far very quickly. <laughs> so a lot of the key is just to work with a smaller team um, and, you know, don't try to build a camel. Figure out how to come to consensus about what needs to be done. Um, and accept that there are multiple right ways. Be humble enough to know that, that your way isn't always the right way either. You know, I, I'm thinking about what you've been talking about here about a common problem is adding 
unnecessary layers of complexity that don't need to be there. And when I'm thinking about um, automation and software defined networking, which have been huge buzzwords for the last several years now, um, you know, I, I've met a lot of engineers who have been really good at the command line of whatever it is they work on, Juniper, Cisco, whatever. And, and you know, they can implement, implement pretty much any feature protocol with ease. And there's a lot of pushback when it comes to getting on the gravy train of automation and software defined networking, because some of these engineers will say, look, the network already works as it is. There's already plenty of features and protocols out there to do everything I need. Adding automation and software defined networking to it seems to me to be adding unnecessary complexity to something that already works. How would you respond to that? Because I know that you've written and you've had a lot of podcasts about software defined networking and automation. Yeah. So to some degree, I would agree with them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there is some point at which you're adding automation just to add automation. But on the other side, if automation drives us to a world where we get off the keyboard and we move more towards intent and more towards uh, doing troubleshooting and stuff at a higher level, it allows us to put to push everything to a larger scale and be much more effective at what we do and stop focusing on how do I configure this, but what is what is it I'm trying to get done? And of course, intent has two different levels. One would be a business level intent. The other would be an intent at the protocol level, like saying, I want to peer from here to there. Does it really matter if you know what the commands are to configure from pe a peering session for BGP? Or does it really matter that you're trying to configure an eBGP peering session and that has implications about what you should and shouldn't con uh, configure in different environments. Mm -hmm. And so that I think is where the answer lies is somewhere in there. Now, of course, I also think that automation is kind of stuck in the middle ages right now. We're doing an awful lot of screen scraping to get automation to work. And we really need to stop. We really need to start figuring out how to use machine interfaces to get things done a lot more than what we're doing right now. And would you say that automation is still primarily stuck in, in vendor proprietary solutions and, and, and open source solutions still largely don't exist as of yet? Uh, well, I think that's probably true. I think there are, um, there are open source and open standard solutions coming up, but we've got to realize that vendors um, have an issue with differentiation and how they make themselves different to their customers. Mm -hmm. And you know, that gets into feature issues and stuff like that. And so you've got to think through what's the trade-off as a vendor and as a customer, what's the trade-off um, of getting to the point where you don't, where you don't have vendor specific automation stuff any longer. Okay. And along the same lines, talking about automation and software defined networking and stuff. I mean, for people who are familiar with Cisco's certifications and who have sort of tracked along with those over the years and seen their changes. And the same might be true of Juniper certifications and, and other vendors as well. We've certainly seen that even at the lowest level, like the CCNA, uh, Cisco is starting to introduce more and more required knowledge of automation. Um, and certainly when it comes to Cisco, like their own DNA center and their own automation platforms and stuff like that. And there, there may be quite a few network engineers out there today who, like I said, are really good on the command line, really good at implementing whatever, and maybe automation and software defined networking sounds intriguing to them, but what's holding them back is this general mindset of, man, if I go into this world of automation and stuff, do I really need to be a coder? Do I need to learn scripting? Do I need to learn, you know, Ruby or Perl or something? And and because that scares me. So what would you say about people who are thinking along those lines? So first of all, I go back to my first answer, which is you need to learn to have the coding mindset, even if you're not a coder. And so if you already have the coding mindset, then learning the coding itself at a high level through uh, scripting language or something like that, then, you know, it's not a big deal to do that, right? I mean, once you have the mindset, then learning the coding is not that big of a deal. And modern languages like Rust and Go and, and uh, uh, mostly Rust and Go, are by and large much easier to code than C. I'm an old line C coder. I've been coding C for 20 something years. <clears throat> and oh, maybe 30 years, I don't know, but whatever it is. But, um, you know, C is a scary language. Rust isn't so scary. 
Go isn't so scary. Uh, it's a lot harder to make a mistake in Go or in C or in uh, Rust than it is to make a, a mistake in C and blow, thing, and blow things up. So when you're scripting, you know, learning scripting is not nearly as hard as, as being a full on like C coder or something. So I would say, yeah, go learn it. I mean, you're going to want to eventually anyway. So just go do it. And uh, once you learn it, I think you'll be quite surprised at, at how useful it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. So shifting gears a little bit, tell us a little bit about this book coming out, Unintended Dystopia. Um, oh, my. Right. Yeah, goodness. That's more of a philosophy thing. I don't know what you want to talk about that. But I am making an argument in this book that social media has a very negative impact on individual users. And the whole book is basically uh, developing that argument and why I think that and how that works. And by the way, that's really my dissertation. That book is really kind of a, a modified, um, expanded version of my dissertation. Mm -hmm. So now social media and, and the platforms that drive it have in a large sense, really expanded networks and, and, Yep. force people to develop new features and stuff. So by saying it's a bad thing, that's kind of risky, right? For a network <laughs> engineer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm kind of making a contrarian statement a little bit. I don't think it's all bad. I think there are ways of using it that aren't bad. But yeah, that uh, yeah, you know, I'm running a little counterculture here with this. But um, yeah, I just think that in general, that it's not so much about the network, the, the media systems themselves, it's the mental habits that, that using them causes. We tend to stop treating people as people and start treating them as an audience or as a like or something like that. And it's as much about that as it is anything else. Um, worrying about our platform, worrying about whether or not we're gonna get 5,000 likes versus 100 likes or whatever it is, all the statistics. For a company, that's one thing, but for individuals, it can be very unhealthy to mm -hmm. be trapped in that in that thing. Okay, and and I see that Catherine has another question from the audience that she'd like to run past us. Thanks, Keith. Uh, yeah, this is from Walter, who's watching on YouTube. Thanks for thanks for the question, Walter. Um, is the CCIE EI still relevant in this day and age? And then a follow up question to that: What advice would you give to network engineers who are about to retire? Oh my goodness. The first one is, yes, I think so. Um, again, it depends on your attitude towards it. If your attitude is, I'm going to get this stuff in on my resume and lots of people are going to come ask me to work for them and I'm going to get lots of money and blah, blah, blah. That's one thing. If your attitude about the CCIEI is to say, I'm here to learn something, then every certification has value in that case, right? Um, what would you give to network engineers about to retire? Get a hobby. <laughs> <laughs> Build yourself a shop and learn how to be a maker. I don't know, you know. <laughs> Great advice. So, you know, we, we spent a lot of time talking about Cisco because, you know, that's where my background is, what I'm familiar with, and you came there, but you're with Juniper now. Yes. Uh, and Juniper has some of their own certifications. I I know next to nothing about Juniper certifications. So can you tell us a little bit about what they offer and, and what their top level certifications are like, especially comparing and contrasting them to Cisco's? So my kind of belief or understanding of the Juniper certifications, knowing that I actually don't have any Juniper certifications, <laughs> is they are very very similar in scope to the Cisco certifications, but focused on the Juniper way of doing things, which is a little bit different than Cisco's. Juniper's way of doing things is much more automation first or always has been. Um, and Cisco's there now, but you know, many, many years back when, when the Junos CLI was created, it was an automation for CLI. And so that's kind of been baked into that world a lot longer. And so I think there's, I think there's just some slight, there's some differences. I wouldn't say slight differences. I would say there are differences in those realms. And honestly, if you're CCIE and you're thinking about whether getting a CCIE, if you're an EI and you're thinking about getting something else, I don't know, maybe go outside of your vendor realm and go get some other certification at the same level from another vendor mm -hmm. or just go get a degree. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good advice. <laughs> um, another thing that I'm wondering about, and, and this is another question I get from people a lot is, you know, it, it used to be, bring it back to Cisco again, that at the CCNA level, there were CCNA specialties. There were CCNA wireless, CCNA routing and switching. That's no longer the case. There's just one CCNA now. And your, your opportunity to specialize doesn't really happen until you get to the CCNP level and, and above. So, you know, we've spent a, a good deal of time talking about, you know, the enterprise, whether it be CCNP or CCIE enterprise, uh, but there are other specialties out there as well. And one question I get from people a lot is, should I specialize? And if so, what should I specialize in? Uh, how would you address that? Oh my, I'm never a big fan of special, too deep of specialization. Just ever, haven't ever been. I am much more inclined to say that if you have a CCIE, you know, go out and get something different. Um, like I see people with five and six CCIEs, awesome, great for you. But I just really, I don't know, to me, once you have one or two CCIEs or two expert level certifications or whatever it is, branch out. Seriously, go get a, go get a college degree. There's a lot of networking college degrees now. There's a lot of other college degrees that might actually be useful to you. You know, go to a certificate program in business or something, not, not necessarily an MBA, but yeah, branch out a little bit, you know, learn other things, go get a cert cert uh, some sort of a certification in security uh, or something else like that. And so um, you'll notice I only have one CCA and one CCDE and then the CCAR. I never went and got all the other CCIEs. Um, I just kind of stuck with what I had, although I did get a BSIT and MSIT and MACM and then the PhD. And so I, I you know, even so, I have tried to branch out a bit. Okay. And an another question that people ask me a lot is people who are thinking of breaking into the networking world and, and maybe they have been studying networking, maybe they got their CCNA, but the, a common question is, how do I get experience? I, I'm not working in networking right now. I'd like to work in networking at some point in the near future. How do I get from point A to point B without having any experience? What are your thoughts on that? Ah, well, two options. First, take the plunge. Stop being afraid to apply for a job in networking. Just go do it. I don't know. I mean, I think we're often very, very afraid to step into situations we're uncomfortable with. And I think we just need to stop doing that. Um, the second one is lab, lab, lab. I mean, I don't do a ton of labs anymore, but back in my younger days, I spent tons of time in the lab learning protocols and learning how things work. Um, even more, perhaps get involved in an open source project in the networking space, right? And in some network monitoring or telemetry project or something, get to know people and work a little bit around supporting that open source community. And then when you walk into that first interview, people will say, well, how serious are you about networking? Well, I'm serious enough that I'm involved in this open source community and I'm helping them build network monitoring tools. Mm -hmm. you know? How do people find those open source communities if that's a, an avenue they wanna take? Hmm. Yeah, that's a hard question. So I don't know. On the hedge, I try to cover open source communities from time to time. You can find them there. You can find write ups um, like Walmart just did a write up on their LFA stuff or their um, not LFA stuff on their eBPF stuff. Uh, it's kind of hard to know what the hot project is right now, but uh, that's, you know, something that I think you can do is just poke around. I think you can find stuff. You can find even single, like uh, there is a, uh, there is an MRT or something like that. There's a, there's a trace route that I use all the time that's been written by somebody and they're a single maintainer. They just manage the whole project themselves. Go offer them help. It's a very useful little, they have, there's a bunch of little useful utilities out there around DNS and stuff that help people troubleshoot big networks. And I mean, go to CADA and say, or, Kata and say, I'm here to volunteer to help you with one of your projects or write labs and they'll take you in. They'll, they'll find something for you to do. Okay. And, and correct me if I'm mistaken, but aren't the, you know, well-known organizations of like the IEEE and the IETF still 
largely made up of people volunteering their time who are working other jobs? I mean, if, is that an approach that somebody could take is to volunteer for an IEEE committee or some IETF yep. RFC that's out there right now? Or ONUG or ONC, uh, Open Network Computing, you know, ONC or any of those? Yep, sure. I mean, the ITF in particular has lots and lots of um, really good working groups working on stuff. You can just go out there, read drafts, even if you're making grammar changes or grammar suggestions, those are still welcome. Even if you're saying, I'm a newbie and I really don't understand what you're talking about here, please explain this to me, to the author. A lot of times that helps the author um, clarify their thinking in a way that's really useful for them. That's great. I, I never even thought about that approach before. I see that Catherine also has another question from the audience that she'd like to run past us. Yeah, I feel like I'm raising my hand over here waiting for Keith to call on me, <laughs> the principal's office or something. You're not uh, jumping. You gotta jump. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we are getting some great questions in, guys. Thank you so much for, for all the questions. Keep them coming. We still have some time here uh, today. This question is from Afri, watching on YouTube right now. Afri, thanks for the question. I'm studying and labbing to be a cloud architect. Will the CCDE help me with the thought process for designing virtual networks and data centers? My answer would be yes. Anything that helps you learn the design thought process. Um, design is not like is not like trouble well troubleshooting isn't so much as people think it is either but um design is more as somebody said earlier it's kind of like it's subjective i wouldn't say it's purely subjective but it is partially subjective and design is more of a seat of the pants thing and anything more you can do to practice at it and to learn the principles and just to get a feel for things um, the better off you are that's, that's kind of my opinion. Like we used to have this thing on Cisco.com that said you can only put on 50 routers in an OSPF area. Uh, hard and fast rules don't work like that. You, you really have to kind of know what you're looking for and kind of think about things. So anything will help you in that realm is good. Um, I, I mentioned earlier when I first introduced you that you're uh, uh, in a leadership role in this free range routing project. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what that is, what problem that was designed to solve and just give us a little bit of information about it? Yeah, so FR Routing is a an open source routing stack, totally community supported. We have, um, you know, we just have a bunch of people working on building OSPF BGP, OSPF B3, IS to IS. They're all fairly decent. Some of the implementations are better than others. We have a Slack. We have a Tuesday standing meeting. In fact, we had two meetings this Tuesday. I was in both of them. There's multiple meetings per week. And it's just an open source project. And you can run it as a container. And it's used by companies like by NVIDIA and, uh, and um, other places to actually do production work. And it's used by some companies as a route reflector or a route server or a looking glass or whatever it is. Uh, but it's also just a good place to learn how the routing protocols work, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. We got, in a, we got in a discussion about null labels in BGP this morning, for instance. <clears throat> so is this sort of also designed for, for people who are thinking mm -hmm. of you know, instead of implementing Cisco or Juniper solutions in their network, they're thinking, hey, I'd like to implement a, a white box router and maybe I can put yeah. FR routing on top of that to make that a full blown yeah. router. That way I'm not dealing with any proprietary solution. Yeah, right, right. Yes, exactly. Um, and there are pros and cons to that. I mean, I work for a vendor, so I'm still going to just sit here and say, yeah, there are, there are pros to vendor implementations like CRPD and Juniper and Viata or not Viata, but Juniper and Arista have containerized routing stacks that you can get. Um, there are, there are advantages and disadvantages to those. But it's an alternative, and it's a great community. Um, it's 30-something people on the meeting on Tuesdays, and it's really, you know, it's a cool little community, a moderate-sized community, and you can learn a lot about how routing protocols are developed and deployed by participating in something like that. Okay, cool. And, and it looks like Catherine has another question that she'd like to toss us from the audience. Yeah, getting a lot of questions coming in about uh, what books you would recommend. And I would actually ask both of you to, to answer this question because Keith, you have so much expertise uh, as well and uh, probably have some great recommendations. So um, 
Users on YouTube asking what books you would recommend, both technical and life books, and then Alvaro specifically asking about network engineer books. Yeah, that's a hard question because I don't like recommending my own stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, your stuff is the best. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, I absolutely so I would, by the way. I mean, I'll just jump in here and say if if you want to learn BGP, Russ's practical BGP book is is awesome. Um, so go to Amazon, type in Russ White and see the books he's got there. And, and any of those are great. So Russ, above and beyond your own stuff, anything else you'd want to recommend? <laughs> well, I'll just say this much. I'm pretty honest about my own stuff. My favorite book of mine right now is Problems and Solutions, which is the last one I wrote. It's big. It's intimidating. It's 850 pages. Ethan Banks and I wrote it. And I know that it's, you're going to read it and you're going to be like, wow, this is way too technical. But it's just really, for me, it's one of my favorite things. Now, Jeff Doyle has a love of, has really, has really taken off on um, the network complexity book. And he really likes that one. <clears throat> so I think those are, I think those are probably good suggestions. Optimal Ronnie design, whatever. Above and beyond those, I mean, there's a few books that are kind of open sourced by Bruce Davey, if you look him up. Uh, and they are actually out there and you can grab them for a donation. And I really like his stuff. Um, I tend to go back to the classics a good bit. Tenenbaum's networking book, which has a lot of really good illustrations in it. And of course, Radius book, Interconnections, they're very dated, but they tend to be very good. But by and large, I do a lot of my learning on networking, not through books, but through research papers now. So, mm -hmm. but if you were starting out, I mean... I would, you know, those are the kinds of places I would go would be problems and solutions and, and maybe Tenenbaum and Bruce Davies books on MPLS and SDN stuff. Okay. Awesome. And I'm, I'm going to finish up here with, with one more question. So, you know, you've got, um, like we talked about a, a PhD in philosophy from Southeast Baptist theological seminary. You've also got a master of arts in, in Christian ministry uh, from Shepherd's Theological Seminary. And you know, a, a lot of what people watching us today come from, from various different beliefs. Um, and I'd like to ask you, you know, as a network engineer, like any other career, you know, we all have our ups and downs. We all have our difficult moments. We all have moments where we're wondering how am I gonna get past this problem, whether it be a professional problem or a personal problem. So do you wanna share with us a little bit about how your faith has inspired or encouraged you as you've traveled this long road to becoming where you are right now. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's, this life is not the real thing. This is the real thing, but this is not the ultimate thing. There are other things that are more important. And so that's one thing that gives me hope for the future. And I think that's the biggest thing right there is just having the discipline and the knowledge to know what's in the future, to not know what's in the future, but to know that, you can, you know, you can keep moving. Um, I have a very strong self-discipline. I get up every morning. I work out three, uh, five, uh, six days a week. And, you know, I go to church on Sundays very, very regularly. And I'm involved in a seminary and stuff like that. And I think that community is really important. Now, the other side of that is, is it really impacts my feelings or my thoughts about people. So C.S. Lewis has this great thing that he said once that, that really sticks in the back of my head all the time, which is that regardless of who you're dealing with, remember that if you saw this person in for what they truly were, you'd be more inclined to fall down and worship than to talk to them the way you're talking to them right now. And so I think that just having the utter respect for other people, even if I don't agree with them, knowing that that's, that's, that's where the reality is. It's in those other people. It's not in all this technology. Technology is cool, but the reality is in the people. So I think that's um, that's my uh, I think that's the biggest things that influence me from that world. Great. Well, thank you so much for your your open and honest response to that. We we all appreciate it. So, Catherine, I think that's that's all I have for today. Yeah, Keith and Russ, thank you both so much. What a 
What a great and, uh, as promised, motivational discussion. Um, I know that, that I've gotten a lot out of it. Hopefully everyone who is watching here today has gotten a lot out of it from the comments that have been watching come in. Um, everyone has, has just really appreciated and loved what you guys had to say. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you to the audience for uh, participating and bringing your energy today. If uh, that wraps up today's stream, if you missed it live, look for the replay across our social media channels as well as on the INE website. You can look for us live again one week from today, Tuesday, October 19th at 1 p.m. Uh, no, today is October 19th, so one week from today, and I can't do the date in my head. So 1 p.m. Eastern on whatever social media platform you choose for another Tech Tuesday. And throughout the month of October, you may have caught us on a couple Thursdays. We are hosting cybersecurity-specific streams in honor of Cybersecurity Awareness Month. This Thursday, October 21st, I know I'm right about that one, we're talking with Marie Galloway, the CEO of Women's Society of Cyber Jutsu. She is outspoken, smart, altogether amazing, very, very interesting. You're gonna to wanna to catch that. Be sure to like and subscribe on the social media platform you're using so you can stay in the loop when we do get live. We'll see you next time. Until then, have a great week.